Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Praise belongs to Allah. We praise Allah and we ask Allah for guidance and for, for forgiveness. And we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whomsoever Allah makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah alone having no associates. And I bear witness that Muhammad is a servant and messenger of Allah. Well, believers, be mindful of God, speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose. And he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you of your sins. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. Assalamu alaikum, my dear sisters and brothers. Um, so today, it's going to be a little um, off the cuff khutbah. My apologies. I got the notice just two days ago, um, asked to do a khutbah, and uh, I knew what I wanted to talk about. But, you know, that's easier uh, to have in your head and then to actually put down in a um, in an organized, structured, uh, comprehensible way. You know, how do I deliver this talk? But um, today I want to talk about uh, transactional relationships and I want to discuss, you know, what they are. This is the first time we've ever heard of this term, tra transactional relationships. Um, how, to how to identify them? Um, what are the negative uh, impacts of transactional relationships? And of course, then the importance of elim eliminating them. So uh, by definition, a transactional relationship is where one or both people treat their interactions like a business deal. This can occur in romantic relationships, uh, you know, marriage, uh, platonic relationships, your friendships, familial relationships, uh, work relationships, et cetera. Um, and as an example, sort of traditional gender roles uh, are an example, are an excellent example of uh, transactional relationships. So uh, on the flip side, in a normal, loving, non-transactional relationship, one would gladly give something to their partner just to make them happy without wanting anything in return. Oh, I know my partner likes um, sunny side up eggs on Saturday mornings. And so to make my partner happy, I'm gonna get up and make them their favorite breakfast with no expectation other than I just enjoy seeing the happiness in, in my partner. Um, you know, you get your child um, a toy that they wanted or like my son is really into Pokemon cards right now. And so I keep trying to hold myself back because I want to buy him all these Pokemon cards because he loves them. But, you know, I get to show some restraint and boundaries. Otherwise it becomes expected. Uh, you know, your friendships, you just, you think of a friend, um, send him a message. Hey, I'm thinking about you. I want to share something with you, something I thought you might like. And you're not thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to keep score. I sent my friend these things. I called my friend this many times and I haven't gotten this many responses back. Um, the other, the latter would be a transactional relationship where you're sort of keeping score. Um, it, so yeah, like in a transactional relationship, um, it, it, you, you know, one part of it is something sort of a quid pro quo, like, you know, I do this for you. What are you going to do for me? And you, you've all seen this, these things occur, right? Whether hopefully you've not, you're not finding yourself in a transactional relationship, but you can probably identify moments where you felt that you've been in a tra transactional relationship or um, you've identified others being in a transactional relationship. Um, and in those, you know, people don't do something just for the sake of being nice. Everything is calculated. Um, you know, if you give something or do something, it's because you want something in return, you know, money, raising the children, a higher status, uh, you know, whatever it is, I, I know that I lived in a certain part of the country where, and I thought it was just me at first, but then I started to, you know, talking to other sort of transplants, people who weren't from that area. And we saw, were sort of lamenting on how, doesn't it seem like um, everything is, you know, every conversation is sort of rooted in what can I get out of this? You know, if you do the, if I ask you for something or you ask me for something, what are we going to get in return? You know, how is this going to elevate whatever? Um, and then I, I'll, I'll admit it, when I moved to Austin, I realized like, whoa, that's, it's not like that anywhere. I think Austin is one of those places where I found people to be nice and generous just for the sake of being nice and generous because they really wanted to. So um, a, a little um, 
you know, acknowledgement uh, for Austin, the Austin, the people of Austin. Um, so anyway, so counter this with what Allah says in the Quran. And so um, in the 30th chapter, verse 21, another of his signs is that he created spouses from among yourselves for you to live with in tranquility. He ordained love and kindness between you. There truly are signs in this for those who reflect. So, um, you know, this verse is specifically speaking to marital relationships, but this concept can surely be expanded to other relationships, you know, especially familial relationships, you know, the, the parent, the child parent relationships. And we'll speak more on that part in a little bit. But let's going back to identifying transactional relationships. Um, so, again, Transactional, transactional partnerships are all about trying to get the most out of your partner in exchange for as little as possible. Um, and this relationship is based on how much you can take rather than how much you can give. Um, you know, it, identifying whether or not you are in any type of transactional relationship, be it, you know, are you the one who is asking for more than you're going to give, or are you being taken advantage of? You know, do you do you approach a relationship thinking primarily of what you can get out of it? You know, do you feel as if you are always getting the short end of the straw in a relationship? Right, those are the two sides of a transactional relationship. Um, and so that earlier definition um, was kind of put out there by Google. You know, you Google transactional relationships, and it gives you a list of all these things. But Google went on to say, as such, these partnerships never last a long time. And I totally disagree with that. I mean, I think that'd be great if they didn't last a long time, if one per, one party recognized that they're getting the short end of the straw and they're going, yeah, you know what? I think I got to get myself out of there. But I think we can we can agree that we've all witnessed transactional relationships that have gone on for way too long. Um, and it sort of makes you pause and think like, what is causing that person who's getting less? What's causing them? What's stopping them from leaving? Um, and, you know, we can talk about... Um, we can talk at length about the, the negative and detrimental side of being in a transactional relationship. I mean, I'm sure as just, just by its name itself and the couple of examples I've given, you can easily kind of list a few, you know, kind of red flags, why you would want to get yourself out of a, a trans transactional relationship or encourage someone who you recognize to be in one to get out. But the number one, I would say the most, like the primary element of a transactional relationship is that over time, they tend to breed res resentment. Um, and, and nobody wants that in any type of relationship. You don't want it at work, right? You don't want to re resent your job, resent your boss, resent your coworkers. You don't want to resent um, you know, your parents, your uh, you know, other extended family members, your friends. And of course, you don't want to resent your spouse or your, you know, your partner, your life partner. Um, no one likes to feel used. And people who feel angry or resentful towards a person, um, you know, they're going to become less eager to respond to requests, um, you know, particularly if it's, you know, requiring a bit of a stretch, right? And at the end of the day, being in a transactional relationship is ingenuine for both parties, you know, and, and I don't think that's anything that you would want for yourself or you'd want for anybody that you know or care about it's to be in any type of relationship that just is not genuine. Um, so again, you know, the importance of eliminating them, I think it, you know, go, kind of goes without saying, but we'll just note that, um, you know, no one wants to be in, in any kind of relationship where they feel resentment towards the other person. Um, transactional relationships deplete a person of joy and happiness. And there is zero, zero compassion in transactional relationships. Um, so uh, that is kind of transactional relationships in a nutshell, but now onto some good news. There are definitely clear trends that are showing that transactional relationships are on the decline to a degree. I think, you know, it's a little subject, uh, subjective, but just having a name to what they are is a huge deal. Um, you're seeing articles written about them. Um, this means that people have identified it and there is a push in society to confront them and the harms that they cause. Um, again, you know, I think everyone here, you know, we, we span multiple generations and we can look and say, you know what, what marriages look like today, at least in 
in our culture and our society are very different than what they look like a generation or two generations ago. Um, and so what we're seeing is these sort of modern marriages, again, at least in our society here, are more likely to be based on equal participation. And uh, there's a, a, you know, an, an effort. Um, so equal, sorry, equal participation and effort and that they are rooted in uh, the Islamic prescription of being a source of tranquility and love and kindness, right? So that's, that's sort of what we're seeing come, um, uh, and, and I'm speaking mainly primarily in sort of a, a Muslim American um, lens um, that we're seeing marriages come about that are um, more, you know, 50-50 in terms of participation and effort and whatnot. Um, additionally, beyond, beyond marriages, uh, the parent-child relationship has changed greatly over the past few generations. Uh, you know, and, and I can see this in my own family, just from, you know, how my kids are with my husband and I, how we were with our parents, how our parents were with their parents. Uh, it's it's shift, it has shifted quite a bit. So this sort of authoritarian type of parenting is definitely on the downhill. Now, there is a caveat, and, and I think I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge this, that of course, these trends um, that you see uh, are more prevalent in affluent or educated classes of society because those demographics, there's um, an elimination of the struggle of poverty and access to basic needs. Uh, when you don't have access to basic needs, your ability to express compassion and flexibility and patience is diminished. And so for anyone who finds themselves in a position where they are of comfort, I would highly encourage you, of course, to um, help contribute to healthy, you know, producing healthy relationships in our community because we can all benefit from it. I'm not going to go into great detail as to how a random person can be affected by someone else's lack of compassion. But again, if you just think about it, you could probably recognize it. Um, and so going back to the, you know, kind of parent-child relationship, I, I want to highlight one thing, and that's obedience and reverence. So up until I think kind of recently, maybe not, of course, not across the board, but again, it's a trend. We're seeing that um, it used to be the conventional wisdom was that children obey their parents because that is the established power, you know, balance of power. Children follow rules because primarily because they're fearful of getting punished, right? Um, if they don't follow the rules that their parents established, they're going to get punished. And the children are not really allowed to question why the parents set up those rules, you know, or why things are done a certain way. And I want to point out that obedience does not equal reverence. So what is reverence, right? Reverence is sort of an admiration. And how much healthier and contentful would it be if children obeyed their parents because they had reverence for them? That they, that they admired, even if it's subconsciously, right? No, no kid's going to admit that they admire their parents unless they're like literally little. But even so that they admired, um, they had reverence because they admired their parents' guided, guidance and wisdom. So um, I want to close out this first part of the talk with an ask for you. I'd like you to reflect on the relationships in your lives. Um, are, are they rooted in divine traits and divine commands to show compassion and offer love and kindness and be a source of tranquility? You know, are you engaging in relationships that you would like your children or grandchildren, um, if they are of an impressionable age, to benefit from? You know, are, the, are, are they good examples for them? Um, can you acknowledge relationships that you have witnessed in your life? that have had an impact on how you participate in your own relationships, either positively or negatively. And you can do this without being judgmental, right? You can engage in this reflection without judging others around you or even being too harsh on yourself, right? You can reflect on your lived experience to learn of yourself, of yourself and others without being overly critical or dwelling on things that are out of your control. So I would like to close this first part and I say these words of mine and I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of all mankind. And I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace on the Prophet Muhammad. So uh, in this next part, 
Um, I'd like to pivot a bit. And instead of focusing on relationships between people, I'd like to chat about our relationship with Allah. You know, is it transactional or is it rooted in compassion and love and kindness? Now we know from Allah's side, it is nothing but compassion, right? Allah does not provide blessings to creation in order to gain anything from, from them. Um, and additionally, Allah does not owe us anything, okay? Yet oftentimes we find ourselves sort of making deals with Allah, whether we realize it or not. And um, I, I'll be frank with you all, this talk has um, sort of stemmed from a pet peeve of mine um, that I've sort of built up over the last, I don't know, 10 or 12 years or so. Uh, and, and that is the, um, the quantification of Allah and the hereafter. Um, I'll, I'll put it bluntly. So often, you know, we're told if you do this good deed, you will get this many blessings or this many hasanat, right? You will get this, you know, so it's like it's going in a bucket. Oh, if I um, smile at that person, then I'm going to get 10 hasanat. If I, um, you know, make a relative a meal, if I go visit the elderly or the ill, then I'm going to get this many blessings. And at one point, you got to go. What, what am I, what's my end goal? How many blessings am I trying to gain? Because the way that it's sort of sold to me, it's like as if I'm investing in real estate in the hereafter, right? I want my Jannah plot. And I know that if I reach 10,000 hasanat in my life, that that's what I need to get it. So I'm trying to get there as fast as possible. Just talking like this, it's kind of gross, right? But if you think about it, that's kind of how we've been taught that we need to do good things to get the good deeds and the good deeds will translate into the hereafter or a good spot in heaven. And I don't think that that is a very healthy way to uh, engage in a relationship with Allah. Um, and so I, I wanna talk now about taqwa, reverence. You know, Like I spoke about the parent-child relationship and this is maybe kind of how I, I sort of develop this pet peeve is because I approached parenting um, from a position that I wanted to have a healthy relationship with my children, that I didn't want to be domineering, that I didn't want to be this authoritative figure who, who expected certain things and I expect no questions and I want my kids to obey me without question. And uh, if they don't, then they know that they're going to get punished for it. I don't like that type of relationship with my kids. I don't like that type of relationship with my spouse. I don't like that kind of relationship with my parents, right? Um, why would I want that kind of relationship with Allah? I want to do things that are good, that are pleasing to Allah because I have reverence for Allah. Um, and if you were to pick up almost any English translation of the Quran and flip to a verse where there was taqwa mentioned, more often than not, taqwa is... Um, translated as to fear, having fear of your Lord, having fear of Allah. Um, and a couple of years ago, and I'm going to pull it up on my phone because I looked it up. There's a, um, a gentleman from Isna, his name is Isan uh, Bagdi, uh, really, really sweet, um, sweet soul from the Isna Foundation. Um, and he, he posted something on Facebook and it really, it hit close to me and I wanted to share with you. So this is now, he, these are his words. Um, and he said, Quote, I have one more campaign I want to start. Taqwa does not mean fear. It, it means literally being on guard, being on guard in respect to Allah, being on guard for, for the doing of good and the avoiding of evil. The best translation, therefore, is mindfulness, awareness, consciousness of Allah, of good and bad. It is probably the most important moral spiritual term in Quran. The image that comes to mind is a person in his or her karate stance, on guard. There's no fear there. Another image is of a basketball player. He loves, he says, I love sports. I do too. Um, but totally focused on the game, in the zone. There's no fear there. In fact, if there were fear involved, it would be a distraction. There are other words for fear in the Quran, and they're often used. Taqwa is a state of mindfulness as we make decisions in our life, mindfulness of Allah and mindfulness of what is bad and good with the accompanying ability to choose good and avoid the bad. Thus, taqwa is both a spiritual term, it is, it is ihsan, and it is a moral term of excellence and behavior. The combination of spirituality and behavior is a constant theme in Islam. 
So I remember reading that again, he posted that like two, two plus years ago, middle of pandemic. And I thought that is such a beautiful way to understand taqwa and how you could, um, through that understanding, approach a beautiful relationship with Allah that isn't transactional, that isn't, okay, Allah, I'm going to do these good deeds and I expect those 10 hasanat and the hereafter, you know, put that in my bucket, mark it on my, on my, uh, on my ledger. Um, and the other thing I want to add is I, 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 a couple of years ago, I looked up the English, like the, the root of taqwa and learned that um, part of the root means shield, like a shield of, of Allah and a shield of the protection that Allah provides you. That is having taqwa. It's having that protection from Allah. And so when we fear our Lord, we should fear losing that protection. Um, and um, anyway, I wanted to share that, that bit with you. And of course, as a reminder, you know, blind obedience does not equal reverence, right? That we have to want to do something. We have to want to please Allah because we want to, because we recognize all the blessings that we have been given from Allah. And if we were to approach our relationship with Allah in that manner, you know, can you imagine how much healthier and contentful um, that we would be uh, with that mindset? You know, that if we obeyed Allah because we had reverence for Allah. So in closing, I'd like to bring to our minds um, two verses from the Quran. And this is from Surah Ibrahim, the seventh verse. And Allah says, remember that he, Allah, so uh, remember that he promised, if you are thankful, I will give you more. But if you are thankless, my punishment is terrible indeed. Allah is spelling it out very, very easily. You know, be thankful, be grateful, you know. Uh, even when things aren't going our way, we must be grateful for Allah's blessings um, because alhamdulillah, we all have so much. Even when we feel that we don't, we can stop and reflect and think about how much more, how much we actually do have. And the second verse is um, the 186th verse from Surah Al-Baqarah. O Prophet, if my servants ask you of me, I am near. I respond to those who call me. So let them respond to me and believe in me so that they may be guided. Oh Allah, please accept our good deeds, forgive us our shortcomings and missteps, and allow us to experience much more time of joy and compassion together. Oh Allah, grant us the good things in this world and the good things in the next life, and save us from the punishment of the fire. Oh Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life, and give us the strength to overcome any challenges we may face. Oh Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves for even the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. And if I have said anything of truth, that is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I said anything that was not truthful, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness from that transgression. Amen.